What's going on everybody? It's Brad here uh, for the M3 Network. We're here with the, the independent and art house, uh, art house cinema section. That's my show, so that's what we're, uh, so we're embarking on the journey in right now. So we've got, uh, I'm very excited to be bringing you the Criterion full collection review. This is the second part of this series where we're going alphabetically. I have my, uh, I have my collection on our shelf organized alphabetically. So I figured that's the most efficient way um, and the most logical organized way to go through it. Of course, the Criterion collection is a sort of a brand a company, a label that gathers, you know, they get the rights to all kinds of independent foreign films from around the world through, uh, you know, all different decades and create these really nice, basically collected editions for cinephiles, if you will, for collectors of these types of films, like myself, who really enjoy uh, hours and hours of supplementary material and things like that. So, you know, over the over the course of my my last few years of really diving into the depths of this type of um, of this type of cinema, and I still think I I could go way deeper. I uh, I feel like I said we're just just starting out. Um, I feel like you know there's a lot more to explore. The Criterion Collection has you know thousands or at least a thousand titles in their you know their physical their physical editions. Of course you know you have the Criterion Channel which has a lot more. But in any case, I'd like to get started here. Now we're moving on to the B's, uh, the letter B in the alphabet, and we're going to explore all the films that I have that are under that title. So without further ado, I'd like to get started with probably my favorite of uh, this section, but we have from 1975 from, you know, perhaps my favorite filmmaker, but it's hard to choose. We got Barry Lyndon, directed by Stanley Kubrick, written by him as well. Barry Lyndon is based on the book, oh man, I've, I'm forgetting the, the, the author's full name, but it's like William. Uh, some, here we go, William Makepeace Thackeray. So this film is really a, a rags to riches story, if you will, but set in uh, set in the 18th century, in the 1700s, I would say mid 1700s, getting towards this um, the 1770s, because you have a couple scenes that sort of revolve around the context of the American Revolution. You have Barry. He starts as an Irish peasant, basically not not you know not like a full on like poor farmer, but he's from a he's from a small village. His family has just a you know a small amount of money. They have a very small estate. I believe it's his his uncle and his cousins have a you know again a small estate in the countryside of Ireland. And Barry just you know, he's the type of guy where his whole life he, he feels like uh, he feels kind of trapped in this small this small town type of feel and I know you know it's hard to uh, hard to equate the small town thing when we're talking about a couple hundred years ago but he's a very adventurous and kind of like ingenious type of guy he has this uh, you, I almost think of it as kind of like a mischievous nature but it's a little more earnest than that he just it all stems from he want, he falls in love because you know of course we uh, were a couple hundred years in the past he falls in love with uh, one of his cousins. Um, and he's gonna he was supposed to be kind of having an arranged marriage with one of his cousins that he likes a lot Her name is Nora and uh, the family though has other plans and the family instead the you know the 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 father the the kind of head of the household of the um, The the Barry family he wants to uh, marry the the cousin to an English officer because they think you know I mean again we're talking about much more traditional uh, views of marriage and stuff like that, where you know they they kind of just want the dowry. They want uh, they want to bring in more money for the household, and if she marries this kind of rich uh, military officer, they think that's going to be the best for the family. Barry gets really offended, and I think here, and again, I'm not going to give away the whole plot. But this starts his journey where he develops this, what I view um, as a very severe kind of inferiority complex. And he never wants this type of feeling to happen again. He never wants to, because of status or prestige and stuff like that, ever be denied what he wants again. And so he embarks on this journey that takes him just from, uh, you know, being a common born type of guy in the Irish countryside, all the way up to the European, basically just aristocracy, the political aristocracy of the time. And to me, this film always felt like, basically like, if you can imagine, I would say it feels like The Wolf of Wall Street in a way, like, but told in this different time period, this different time frame of this one guy's like singular rise to um, to fortune through just his wits. And obviously, they, I, I think that the characters of Barry and 
you know, you could say Jordan Belfort are very different in, in their motivations, but essentially, like I was saying before, Barry has this massive inferiority complex. And again, he, he goes on this entire journey that's that becomes consumed with selfishness. And um, I, I think that, that Kubrick's Kubrick's commentary on not only like the will of one man and like what a single person can do if they are uh, entirely committed to something, even if it's not necessarily good, like just the pursuit of riches, what they can actually accomplish. I, I think that this movie also has some of Kubrick's most like biting wit. And I don't know, many people didn't not like this movie necessarily. People think it was boring. It really flew under the radar. And watching all the all the commentary stuff and all the supplemental material really revealed that Kubrick was Kubrick was very sad and disappointed by the uh, by the reaction to this film because he and I, like I would agree think uh, he he thought it was going to be a very interesting film a, a film that that he thought the public would like. But it you know frankly I mean it is basically three hours long so. I don't blame people for not, you know, going crazy for a, a, a very long, um, in that Kubrick style of dialogue, and I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but I, I, I understand the audience reaction, but I have to say I disagree, because for me, this movie makes me laugh out loud in terms of its, its again, this particular wit that Kubrick has to these funny human interactions and these funny situations that are, are in many ways like devastating to Barry and they, they are very inconvenient and, and set him back, but it's really like these challenges and this kind of a misadventure that he goes on, you know, with life giving him all of these obstacles that he has to overcome to reach, you know, his goal of, uh, you know, just becoming not not that not the best person he can be because that's not what he wants but becoming and grasping what he wants in his life which again is these like riches this this prestige this ability to you know not have what he wants denied to him and I, again i think this is one of kubrick's funniest movie movies outside of dr strange love and i i love it to death i've seen it so many times i mean if i could give like like i've said before if i can give a movie a 10 i would I think this movie deserves close to a 10, if not a 10 out of 10. I highly recommend Barry Lyndon. And I would also say this features probably his most stunning cinematography where everything looks like a painting. Everything looks like a painting from the period he used, period accurate paintings to uh, recreate costumes, locations, all kinds of stuff like that. So not only if you want a very interesting story about, again, just one man's rise and fall, the film itself is a absolute visual treat if you're into any artwork, any cinematography, or anything at all. Like every single frame, it's kind of a meme to say every frame is a painting and stuff like that, but this movie I think defines that where every, every frame is a painting and directly inspired by paintings themselves. So again, very Barry Lyndon, I think this should be many people's early additions to their own collection, and it was for me, and uh, I'm very happy that it is, because this movie is awesome. So, going in a very different route though, we have the next film here, but that is Being John Malkovich from 1999 from Spike Jones. And this movie, this movie is a trip in a different way, and you know, it, it's written by Charlie Kaufman, so if you are familiar with his sort of avant-garde, like postmodern style where the story becomes completely turned on its head. The reality of the story begins breaking down and going into insane, crazy levels that no one saw coming, you don't see coming. That is this movie. You think it's, you know, just slightly weird on the surface and then it just literally keeps going from there, becoming more and more absurd. You have Cameron Diaz in this film as uh, the girlfriend to, and forgive me for forgetting the name for a second, but John Cusack playing the main character. Everyone's performance in this is amazing, uh, especially the titular character, if you will, John Malkovich. I don't know, I don't know how they convinced him and talked to him about being in this movie. I don't know how or why Charlie Kaufman thought of this, but, it's simply incredible, and John Malkovich's performance is hilarious. This movie makes you laugh out loud like like it's nobody's business. It is it is truly hilarious, and I think it on the surface it being funny and it's crazy and all of that, it has a lot it has a lot of insight about I think the journey of an artist, which you know where you follow John Cusack's character as he's a puppeteer. You know he thinks no one understands his art, no one. No one appreciates him as an artist, and uh, you really see this become internalized. You see this man that is miserable and that can't get his art out there, 
And the idea, you know, the, the setup of the film, of course, is he's in this weird building that has a tiny door that's like a portal into the into the literal mind of John Malkovich where you can see out of his eyes and you're inside his head and all of this all of this crazy stuff and then Kaufman starts to comment on you know this idea of like living vicariously through someone and is that more real than living yourself and like what does that mean to like feel more alive when you're in a way when you're inside someone else's body and inside someone else's mind instead of your own and it and it asks a lot of questions in terms of like identity and and the persona if you will of of a, of a of a person so again outside of the silliness and the craziness of the movie of course it does have it does have a profound depth and all of that i think that being john malkovich you know also very high score incredible film i i'm a big fan of spike jones um i just recently rewatched her uh with joaquin phoenix but in any case this movie is quite awesome quite hilarious it's also got a super nice super interesting design too with the eye here and that's like the pupil is like the portal all that kind of stuff so highly recommend this film um as well so moving on here we've got 1947's Black Narcissus, okay? So this is by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. This film's from 1947, like I said, and this movie is simply incredible. And an interesting story of why I got this, this was in 2019, an article put out on Criterion's website from Ari Aster, who made Midsummer and Hereditary, one of my favorite filmmakers working right now. He cited this as one of the influences that, um, behind making Midsummer, and so I was like, all right, gotta check it out and uh yeah no this film is is amazing for the 40s it's it's a complex story about these nuns that are trying to create basically a school and like a center for the poor children of the surrounding area and so they go to like basically an abandoned abandoned like castle in the himalayas and they are converting that into like a convent and like a school and stuff like that and you basically are following these these women as you know they're the, the, through the struggles of trying to make this a reality and one of the one of the women has basically falls into this psychological breakdown and you follow sort of the tumultuous story surrounding that now i've only seen this movie once so it's not going to be as extensive of a you know summary here but this film is incredible again when you think about classic cinema from 1947 i i think this is a film that many people should see and i think i don't know it would be very popular in the in the time now i think that audiences would really like it if people were talking about it and my personal favorite thing about it is the technology that they use to create these massive landscape shots and this this type of thing where you see this not primitive version of special effects but a a more a more rudimentary uh, a a special effects process that is you know sort of removed from any sort of computerized things or complex um layering but what they do is of course they do the matte painting method where you're you're taking uh, parts of the film frame and lining them up in shooting different perspectives us using lens and perspective and stuff like that to basically extend a space make it seem like whatever you want and and so using the mountain landscapes of the Himalayas, they have some incredible, breathtaking shots of these mountain slopes and all of, all of the stuff in terms of the mountain terrain that, again, it's all just shot on a soundstage or on a location that's not in a mountain and is on flat ground. And the stuff that they accomplish, like, like this very shot on the cover here, but if you can see the edge, um, the edge of this, uh, this cliff where the, where the bell tower is um, in this scene, all of this on the lower half of the frame is a painting and uh, up here is like the actual set and there's some behind the scenes photos of this so again if, if Sam can find this in the editing we'll, we'll put it up on the screen but you know this even alone just the cover image alone is an example of the incredibly impressive matte painting work done here so again I highly recommend Black Narcissus as well this is an incredible movie watched it by myself just one night on a whim was blown away cinematography all of that also excellent great film I know that was brief, but we're, we're moving on here. So next, we have, from 2013, we have Blue is the Warmest Color, and I always find this guy's, I believe he's Greek, this guy's name to be very hard to pronounce, but it's Abdelatif. Okay, actually, never mind. I'm not even going to say the uh, the last name. I have no idea. But um, you will put it up on the screen. But um, this guy's... Uh, th this film is very interesting. I have found it on uh, on sale at a movie trading company here. Used movie store, basically, for like 10 bucks. And I was like, you know what? I've heard this movie is very good. It's a little 
controversial, I know, but I don't know. I found the story to be very compelling and to be very interesting. It's like three hours long, but it's basically following this high school senior. She's um, she's in France. Basically follows in what I would call like a postmodern love story, basically. Basically a, a film that examines romance especially young romance when someone's you know at the cusp of being at the end of being in high school as a teenager going into adulthood what are they experiencing and uh, the main character she goes on a journey where she's kind of torn between she she's in love with this um with with uh, this this art student who's played by leah sado who's in the college and you know she's a wild i mean quote unquote like wild very free type of person you know she has a short like her hair is like dyed blue type of haircut stuff like that and so she's very um the the main uh teenager played by adele x Arcopolis, she is very like enthralled by this girl and and so they start have a burgeoning relationship. But she's also torn between having an actual boyfriend. And so you see this kind of like love triangle, this struggle, this uncertainty that, that the main character feels within herself. And I think, you know, it's very fascinating. It's a very tender movie. It's shot very, very well. I really enjoyed watching it. And like for that reason as well, I will say as a... <laughs> As a warning, people complained about this, um, you know, when it was put on uh, the film festivals that it went around with. Khan, I believe, like it says on the, uh, like it says on the packaging here. There is a lot of uh, extended and graphic uh, nude scenes, you could say. And even just watching it by myself, I will say it becomes a little uncomfortable just in terms of like, why is this still like going on? You think you could cut away? Stuff like that. But then again, I think that's sort of the filmmaker's prerogative and, and I think that what that makes you feel is, is still valid even if you are uncomfortable, even if you don't necessarily enjoy it. So I, I still think it's fine. It's a really good movie, like I said, but that's sort of my only critique is that it becomes, you know, you could say a little uh, gratuitous in a way. So take that with a grain of salt, if you will. Still a great movie that I encourage people to watch. So next we have from 1985 by Terry Gilliam, we have Brazil, which is basically Terry Gilliam's, his own adaptation of 1984 by George L. Orwell, where you know, you're in a uh, dystopian world in the future, everything's controlled by Big Brother, things of that nature. So this follows the, a character that's essentially like the main character of 1984, where he works in this records department for the massive, massive uh, dystopian like state bureaucracy. And so Brazil, like I said, you follow this main character played by Jonathan Price. Most people will probably recognize him as uh, the High Sparrow in Game of Thrones, the later seasons. But he plays, you know, the main character. He's this low, low guy on the totem pole in this crushing dystopian bureaucracy. And uh, it's like 1984. It's his journey of uh, basically awakening to the reality that he is in, Un starting to notice that everything about reality is completely warped, is completely wrong. And he goes on this crazy journey that blurs the line between his own dreams and his own subconscious and reality to try to break free from sort of the mental prison, the mental like malaise that he's in, in this dystopian society that is called Brazil. And so if you're a fan of 1984, if you if you get what's going on in terms of the world and society and, and how things are in a way, in many ways dystopian already, this movie is very enlightening. And I feel like despite its darkness and despite its dour parts and it's, you know, the oppressive nature of, of what's happening within the story, I think it can be uplifting and is a, you know, shows I think the value of, of humanity and man being free, if you will. So Brazil is insane. It's Terry Gilliam, so you know you're gonna get some insanity. It's incredible. I highly recommend people watch it. Get this movie. Okay, next one here. So we're gonna start with the next movie on the list here. And we have Breaking the Waves. This is an early Lars von Trier film. This is 1996, so still, um, still over a decade away from making things like Antichrist, The House That Jack Built, Melancholia. So he's he's at least a decade away from the Depression trilogy, which is those two films, including uh, Nymphomania. And, and Breaking the Waves, I've only seen this movie once and I wanna get back into it. I wanna watch it again. It's about two and a half, almost three hours. But basically, it follows this woman in, in a village, like a small town in Scotland, and she and her husband, she's very religious, she's very pure, 
Um, she gets married to just a hardworking guy um, in Scotland. And um, so basically what happens is her husband is catastrophically injured, uh, I believe on the job. And uh, you know, he's like paralyzed or something like that. Again, I'm, I'm gonna leave the details loose. One, because I don't fully remember. And two, I don't wanna just give the whole movie to you. But in any case, he he's injured on the job. And it, of course, because it's Lars, it's a very weird journey that they begin to go on where essentially he's commenting on the perhaps Perhaps the sacredness of, of human sexuality and, and, and sex in general as the husband is basically telling his wife, the main character of the story, that basically he's okay with her in her life, like um, knowing other men and uh, stuff like that because he feels basically guilty in a way that he can't give her, he can't satisfy her needs like on that level as a spouse. And in that way, you can you can really empathize with, with what he's thinking and what this couple is going through as it's a very traumatic sort of psychological journey. And you can really empathize, like I, because in many ways, like who who can put themselves in that shoe? Who can who can ask themselves those questions? Who who can ask themselves like, would I be willing to do something like that? What is what does marriage mean? How how important is the physical aspect of a relationship between men and women? I think these are all very fascinating questions that Lars asks in this movie. And I would say again, I I've watched it a couple years ago, and I don't remember it too much in terms of like what happened as much as his other films really stick with me. But this one is still very profound. Found and it had that that very common Lars thing where you have this kind of melancholy depressing feeling where it's not it's not fully just fully utterly dark where it feels like you've learned something but you're still left with this like huh that was still a sad like depressing story so it is kind of a mixed feeling that you're left with but it really is it really is a fantastic movie so I highly recommend Breaking the Waves again not my favorite of Lars's movies I think all the ones that I mentioned I like way more but this is still a very solid film early Lars, like I said in '96, so I highly recommend this one as well. I feel like it goes without saying. I'm gonna, rec I'm gonna recommend these movies. There's only been one Criterion that I bought and I didn't like it, but we'll get to that. So the last movie on the list, and this is the only one I haven't seen out of the the 50 or so films that I have. There's only a handful. Uh, there's like three or four that I still have yet to watch. But this is Edward Yang's from 1991. It's Taiwanese and it's called A Brighter Summer Day, which is taken from an Elvis lyric that he has in the trailer and you know even the Elvis record is part of the uh, the cover image here but this is a Taiwanese film that I believe is uh, is almost four hours long if not four hours but it's basically like a crime film like a film about youth and stuff like that where basically from what I can gather about the plot and I and I myself have tried to be very hands-off with this because I've heard this is such such a good movie and I don't want to spoil anything but what I can summarize about the plot is in the 1950s and 60s where you have a lot of political turmoil in Asia especially Southeast Asia like you know you have the Chinese communist revolution and stuff like that so we're dealing with a rapid change of not only modernization but the political landscape of this region and uh, you're basically following these kind of gangs of like like street youths and stuff like that and like the main character is like a teenage guy like on the cusp of like going into adulthood stuff with his girlfriend and I know that there's crime involved with like a murder and stuff like that and it's basically a journey of uh, you know from adolescence into adulthood of these kids with all of these other implications and stuff like that happening in the background so I feel bad in saying that that's all that I can <laughs> All that I can really say about this one, because again, this was a blind buy for me. Um, my roommate Porter, shout out to Beans if he's watching. He also bought this movie, and I believe he watched it before I did and, and was really talking highly about it. So just from the cover alone, I'd always been interested in, in seeing this. And again, I want to branch out. I really like Japanese cinema, so I want to branch into more stuff of the from the Asian sphere, basically. And so this is very, very, very high on my watch list. But yeah, Brighter Summer Day by Edward Yang, supposed to be... A masterpiece of, of Asian cinema and just of cinema in general so I can't wait to get into this and uh, if you can find it maybe without buying the criterion watch it first but I just went screw it I love the collection so I want I want the film so there it is I'll maybe make a, a sell a solo review video now that people have seen this once I finally watch it but to wrap up here we've got Barry Lyndon being John Malkovich black narcissus blue is the warmest color Brazil Breaking the Waves, and then finally, A Brighter Summer Day by Edward Yang. So, 
I hope you enjoyed these uh, mini reviews and sort of discussions about uh, the Criterion Collection. Again, this was the alphabetically the B section of the of my shelf here. So join me in the next week where I'll be going through the C's. And of course, if uh, one letter or something like that is shorter, then I'll just kind of combine them to give you around five or six films in a thing. So in any case, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you uh, subscribe to the channel and check out uh, all of our other videos on the M3 network.